Our lessons today give us an interesting contrast between two kings of Israel, David, the greatest of all the kings of Israel, and Herod, maybe one of the worst of the kings of Israel. Herod, who was a puppet of the Roman government and yet ruled over part of his father's kingdom. Now, some of you may watch Game of Thrones. I don't know. One of the confusing things about that show for me is that everybody has the same name and I can never tell them apart. And I feel the same way about the Bible. Everybody seems to have the same name. So what Herod are we talking about? There was Herod the Great, Herod the Great, who had ruled over all of Israel and had built many palaces, including Masada and also Herodium. A few of us several years ago went to the Holy Land and got to visit his palace at Herodium. It was Herod the Great who was the Herod who had the innocents killed, right? The little babies who were around the same age as Jesus because he had the prophecy that a new king was coming. And so that is often called the massacre of the innocents. That was Herod the Great. His son, Herod Antipas, is the Herod of this story. Herod Antipas, who is the youngest son of Herod the Great and the one that Herod the Great really didn't want to inherit. But two of his sons were killed and then another son tried to poison him. This is a great family. Um, and so he was left with the youngest son, Herod Antipas. But at the end of his life, he changed his will because he still didn't like this kid. And so he said he can only have part of the kingdom. He split his kingdom into three parts. And so Herod only had one section to rule over, which I'm sure kind of stuck in his craw. And so he got his own back by stealing his brother's wife, Herodias, and marrying her. Again, great family, right? Could be a soap opera. So Herod uh, marries Herodias, and Herodias knows that John the Baptist, this crazy preacher that her new husband somehow likes for no reason at all. Why does Herod like John? Well, John speaks with the voice of God, and inside Herod, corrupt Herod, weak Herod, there is something in there, some spark of conscience that responded to the prophet's words. He knew that John was a good and righteous man and he liked to listen to him because he felt like he was in the presence or hearing the voice of God. Well, good old Herod is at a party, he gets drunk and he gives his stepdaughter often known as Salome. If you ever heard of Salome, this is Salome. He tells her, you can have whatever you want. She runs to her mother. I just won the lottery. I, well, I can ask for anything. And what does her mother tell her? I'm going to get that guy if it's the last thing I do. And she does. And so Her Herod beheads or has John beheaded in prison. These stories are so evocative for us because they are deeply reflective of the problematic world that we live in, right? These stories could be written today. We still live in, world, in a world where these kinds of things happen, where we're beset by political violence, where leaders seem to disappoint us every different week in a different way, right? We have no perfect leaders, no perfect people. What we have is what we've got. And the Bible reflects that reality to us and then offers us a message maybe to help us interpret the world we live in and to orient ourselves in a different way. King David, also somewhat problematic, the greatest of all the kings of Israel, um, he has been consolidating his power. Last week we heard that he gathered all the leaders of the 12 tribes and they all paid homage to him. He moves the capital to Jerusalem. So he, he's consolidating his kingdom. Now he's got the north and south kingdoms into one greater kingdom. He's got the allegiance of all the 12 tribes and he just needs one more piece to make his control complete. And that is he needs the symbol of God's presence. The Ark of the Covenant. Who here has seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? That's a completely true story. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it does draw on some elements from the Old Testament, including this idea that for many in Israel, the ark 
this box that contained the remnants of the Ten Commandments was the physical presence, so the physical symbol of the presence of God. And so the people carried it around with them like a magic talisman. They would carry it into battle, and they believed that if they had the ark with them, they could not lose the battle. It was like this wonderful um, magic item that they could just always have God's presence with them. It's literally the idea of having God in a box. I can just carry God with me, and whenever I need God, there's God in this box. And so David goes, I need that box. I need that symbol of God's presence here in Jerusalem. If I want to make this the capital, if I want people to see me as the divinely ordained king, you know, anointed by the prophet Samuel, and now with the ark, i got to get it away from the priest. So it's... I, I'm giving you a lot of background because this story has a lot of his historical background. He dresses up like a priest, right? He's the king, but he puts on the linen ephod, which is like a priestly undergarment. He strips off all his royal robes, and he wears this priestly underwear, and he leads the procession from the priest's house, from Obed's house, to Jerusalem. And he is, re I mean, David does things 100%. He's leaping and dancing with all of his might. There's tambourines going. This is a procession. This is not one of our stately Episcopal processions. <laughs> this is a, a wild kind of charismatic procession, right? He's going nuts. And his wife, Michal, sees this, sees him leaping and dancing in his underwear, and she goes, oh, isn't that neat? No. She says, that is horrible. She is the daughter of Saul, right? David married her to continue his idea that he was now the new king. He marries the king's daughter. But she is the daughter of a king and the wife of a king, and she is utterly scandalized. This is not royal behavior. Picture Camilla Parker Bowles, the queen, speaking to King Charles and saying, Honey, your crown is on crooked. Straighten that and look like a king. Right? This is Michal to David. And so she despises David because of his passionate worship of God. Because David, in this moment, is putting God first. Yes, he's making a political decision, but there is also something about David that really loves God that really passionately loves God. He doesn't care in that moment that he looks like a complete idiot. He doesn't care that he is offending his wife. He just cares about worshiping God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is the key. For David in this moment, and yes, he's a politician in many ways, but in this moment, David is focused on one thing and one thing alone, and that is pleasing God. There's more to the story, which I won't bore you with now. Come to Bible study on Wednesdays and we'll explore it. <laughs> this contrast is so evident. Herod, who uses God and uses his position as king really for his own purposes, and in the end is willing to sacrifice God, or at least God's messenger, John, in favor of his appearance, right? He wants to look good to his guests. Herod, who is willing to sacrifice what he knows is right in favor of his own power, prestige, and position, versus David, who is willing in this moment to sacrifice everything for the joy of being in the presence of God. Our scriptures today give us in our challenging day, in our problematic world, a world in which there is still, sadly, terrible violence, political violence, a world in which we see um, the innocents massacred all over the place, gives us a message about how we are to understand ourselves and our role in this world. We're not kings like David or Herod, and yet, we are granted the ability to worship God as well. And to ask ourselves, and here to me is the key question. It's a question that Abraham Lincoln was asked in the Civil War. Someone asked him once, 
hey, it's, isn't it wonderful that God is on our side in this war? And Abraham Lincoln stopped him and said, I am not so worried about God being on our side. He said, what I care about is that I should be on God's side. Think about that difference of perspective. So often, like Herod and sometimes like David, we are tempted to use God for our own purposes. To say, I know what's right, I know what I want, and God should give it to me. I was saying at 8 o'clock that God is like the divine Santa Claus in that picture. He just gives us what we want. But no, in, in the modern world, God is like Amazon because <laughs> we order what we want from God, and if it doesn't come within 48 hours, we're very upset. How dare? Where is my package? Where is God's answer? Right? We want that kind of God who who follows our agenda. We want the kind of God who always agrees with us instead of the God who challenges us to change, to repent, and to see from a different perspective. I don't know about you, when I read letters from St. Paul and Ephesians is either written by Paul or one of Paul's students, I find it very dense. I read, I read like our passage from Ephesians, which is one giant run-on sentence in Greek, and I'm like, what did he say? But I want you to take this home. Take this passage home and reread it. Because Ephesians, for me, is the answer to the question of how are we to operate in a world and begin to shift from wanting God to see things from our perspective to seeing things from God's perspective. Ephesians gives us, I think, one of the best ways of looking at the world from God's perspective. In Ephesians, we read that what God's plan is, God's plan, the whole creation from Genesis to Revelation and beyond, the whole plan is that God will bring all things together in perfection in God's heavenly kingdom. God is going to therefore bring King David and his grumpy wife, Michal, God is going to bring Herod and John the Baptist all together into God's wonderful redemption. This is a powerful image of God's amazing vision for what God desires for us and from us. And what we need to do is to shift our perspective. Instead of asking, God, what have you done for me lately? We need to be asking, how can I see and get on board, God, with what you are doing in the world? How can I be an agent of reconciling love? How can I be a person that brings light instead of darkness? How can I be a person who speaks peace when there is conflict? How can I be a person who acts with love even in a world so full of hate? How can I be a part of this plan of salvation which predates me and which will continue into the end of time? How can I get on board with what God is doing? Not, is God on my side, but how can I be on God's side? I invite you to meditate on the words of Ephesians and I invite us all in this very troubled moment in our history and in our nation and in our world to be trying to see with the eyes of God, a God who loves all of us despite our differences, a God who has room for all of us, and a God who has a purpose and a plan for all of us. May we see that vision clearly, and may we be given the grace to act accordingly.